Yes, tonight I'm going to talk about the Somerset wetlands. I'll probably fall into the trip of calling it the Somerset Levels and Moors because the, that's the name that it's been known known by for a few years now. <clears throat> but it's a large area, about six, 650 square kilometres. And what I'm going to look at uh, and think about is my own personal perceptions of whether that we've had a conservation success story in this area. So mapping the area, you can see that it's quite extensive and covers uh, a number of ridge rivers that flow eventually into um, Bridgewater Bay and the Severn Estuary. The levels, if we start there, are actually the flat clay lands. Um, they're an older enclosed landscape, species poor, relatively species poor grassland. And it's not until you get to the inland moors where you're on a, a peat soils that the uh, vegetation can become uh, more interesting. So this is the, an inland moor at South Lake Moor and South Lake Moor is part of uh, the now, now super national nature reserve that was established a few months ago. So South Lake is about 198 uh, hectares in size. That's mostly owned by Natural England and is um, has been one of the SSSIs that's now been incorporated into, as I say, this new super national nature reserve. This is a farmed landscape. Uh, in the past, it was pretty much uh, milking cattle, uh, dairy herds out in the fields. And this photograph here dates from about 15, 20 years ago. And this, I believe, is the last what they call milking bale in existence. So at that time and in the 1950s, 1960s, people were kept, uh, farmers were milking their cattle out in the fields. And this represents one of those sort of portable milking bales. <clears throat> the milk was then taken uh, along the droves up to the farms and collected that way. Of late, the area has moved from a dairy pastures to more of a beef uh, industry. There are a few sheep, but it's mainly a uh, beef cattle out there. The land is um, divided up by a series of, of ditches, uh, which we tend to think of as uh, wet fences here because uh, that's what the high water levels keep the uh, keep the cattle or sometimes sheep in, in the fields. So this is a typical view across a wet fence in, in Somerset. A series of rivers cross the levels. Um, the longest one, I think, is probably the River Parrot, which starts its uh, course up in, in Dorset, uh, flows through the county very, very slowly. There's not much of a fall, so the water moves incredibly slowly uh, through the levels of moors and out, of, out eventually into Bridgewater Bay. So here I'm standing uh, on the banks of the uh, of the River Parrot. You can see at this stage, it's just a, a relatively narrow stream really. But now this time of year, particularly today, it's in full flood. So the whole of the uh, area will be uh, overtopping its banks. Plant-wise, the, the rivers, particularly the parrot and the tone, are pretty uh, depauperate in any uh, species. Fennel pondweed is it's about as exciting as it gets in the rivers. The more slow-moving or, or older drains, um, this one, the King Sedgemore drain, was originally um, constructed in about 1800. This travels across the landscape as well, very slowly moving water through the system. It was updated updated in the 1970s, 1972, as part of a, a 1.4 million scheme to construct a, a flood relief channel. Flooding has, has always been, and, especially, and I guess will always be a, a significant problem on the area, in this area. Here's another one of those typical drains. This one is at Shapwick Heath, so uh, National Nature Reserve is on the uh, on the left of the photograph here, and this dates back to a, to again to about eighteen hundred. Uh, slightly different vegetation, so here we got uh, a very nice carpet of 
of yellow water lily that uh, uh, soon grows across these these slow moving watercourses. Meadowsweet is one of the commoner plants, particularly along the, the banks of the rivers. It tends to dominate large areas of the, of the area. Um, becoming more common nowadays, I would say, is hemlock. This seems to have taken off very rapidly across a lot of the area now, as does um, hemlock water dropwort. So these are species that I, I guess are very suited to the quite high nutrient levels that we're finding across the uh, the waterways now. And one that has become uh, very dominant and not and hard to miss is this uh, bargeman's cabbage or Bresca wrapper, subspecies compestris here. This has uh, literally taken off over a very large area now. People were originally confused it, of course, with other brassicas, um, but now we, we're pretty sure it is this so-called bargeman's cabbage. More interesting plant-wise is, is marshmallow. This seems to be a plant that's that's doing okay. Um, it has suffered a bit and, and been lost at a few of its sites. There's a coastal site, uh, one of the few sites in Vice County 5, uh, that it was lost from a few years ago. But on here again on, on South Lake Moor, the plant seems to be doing pretty well in the in the conditions that it now finds itself in. Let's have, have a look at and think about the ditches. The ditches are one of the most important features, particularly botanically across the area. <clears throat> so a few years ago, I would have confidently told you the name of all the lemnas here and the wolfias and, and whatever. Um, until we started re realizing that actually there's there's quite a lot of complexity in these small plants, but they do play an important part in the ecology area. They tend to build up to to massive amounts, uh, which can have uh, detrimental effects on the watercourse. Uh, so yeah, we need to look a lot closer at wolfia and other lemnas in this area just just to truly work out what species we've got. A plant that is so characteristic of the ditch network is frogbit, Hydrochera morsus rami. This is, uh, you can almost map the area by, by looking at the extent of that. If we look at the BSBI map here, you can see that it covers pretty much the area of the Somerset levels. It can form great rafts of vegetation across the watercourse uh, by late summer, but then dies down in late winter and, and rests at the bottom of the of the ditch uh, over the winter period. One of the prettiest and one of the earliest to flower are the water violets. They do uh, very well. They seem to be very tolerant of a range of conditions and they are a pretty early colonizer of some of the, of the watercourses. This is a ditch in a new reserve. This is the, uh, the reserve, the Great Ham uh, Grey Lake Reserve. And up until about 10 years ago, this would have been a carrot field. Um, it was uh, arable fields. The RSPB uh, bought, over, bought the area, and now you can see it's, it's extensive reed beds, but, but greater bladderwort um, has colonized that, that area pretty quickly, and this is very spectacular in some of the, the ditches in, within the reed bed. More interesting, but, but probably less common across the levels, is the fen pondweed. This is a, a plant that's uh, fairly restricted in the Somerset levels or the Somerset wetlands. It's uh, probably best seen actually a little bit further north in the area known as the Gordano Valley. Lesser water plantain um, is doing extremely well. Uh, the RSPB manage an area, a large area called West Sagemore, and this is managed primarily for, for its birds. But in doing that management, they created a, a series of shallow um, drains or ditches. And this lesser water plantain has found a good home there and is, is almost a dominant uh, plant in some of these uh, shallow ditch ditches across that area. This, I think, is the, um, the best plant to talk to farmers about. It's the flowering rush. It's big, it's tall, it's easy to identify, 
and, and farmers can appreciate uh, that it's a, an attractive plant. It's quite common um, and uh, is, is relatively tolerant of, of a ra wide range of conditions. Some time ago, less than 20 years ago, um, <clears throat> it was suddenly realized that our sea uh, club rush wasn't actually sea club rush at all. Um, and in fact, it was an, a European species that's probably a native to Britain, just not recognized. Uh, so this is the inland club rush, um, which is extremely common inland. We do still have the sea club rush, uh, Bulbachinus maritimus, on the coast. But inland, we more or less have all of this uh, Bulbachinus laticarpus there. Quite difficult to tell. It, you, need, you do need to look at the fruits very carefully to, to distinguish them. A plant I've worked on for a few years was uh, a rather attractive plant, the greater water parsnip, Siam latifolium, here again at, at South Lake Moor. Um, you can see this is a great big tall umbellifer. And if you're of a certain age, you'll remember BAP uh, projects, biodiversity action plans. And it was thought that uh, this, this plant, the greater water parsnip, required a little conservation help and effort. Uh, so we collected seed. Uh, I collected seed from South Lake Moor. It was grown on uh, very kindly by Bristol Zoo. And we took uh, delivery of, I think it was about 200 baby or greater water parsnip plants. These were duly planted out across areas that the plant had been known in the past. Um, so here we got volunteers planting them in uh, December 2008. Each of the little flags represents where one of the plants was going. Um, that was a very cold day, and I think I made the first mistake there of planting on, on an extremely cold day. Um, a bit later on, we, we planted a second batch out, uh, having learnt from some of the mistakes of the first planting. And all seemed well. The Somerset Rare Plants Group uh, and myself monitored this this plant, but what what we've actually monitored is the decline of this plant. So all of the uh, the little babies that we put out there, uh, having checked this year, uh, I think we only found three plants left. So from the original 200 that were planted out, only three survived. Uh, it's not often we in conservation sort of admit to our failures, is it? But I think that's a, a really valuable um, thing to do in that I still don't know fully why it did fail. Uh, some of the reasons, well, we, we found pretty soon that cattle and deer love to eat the plant and they would literally jump in the ditch or in the watercourse to actually uh, feed on this rather uh, large plant. Anyway, it was a conservation failure rather than a conservation success. A little bit better story is up in North Somerset. So Somerset is normally described, uh, dis, um, divided between the North Somerset levels and the, the Somerset levels. So in North Somerset levels, we also have the Gordano Valley. And this is home to one of the rarest plants. We don't have too many rare plants in, in, the, real, in the Somerset levels, but in the Gordano Valley um, this year, uh, Helena Crouch, who's the Vice County Recorder, and, and Pete Stroh um, came along to, to monitor the brown galingale. This has been known on the site for, well, since about 1900. Uh, a small plant, it's only a few inches in height, although this year some of the plants were quite robust, at four or five inches. Um, it's sort of a mud annual, and it, it really does require uh, sort of the muddy bank of this one ditch. And it requires quite a lot of uh, conservation effort. So every year the landowner, which is uh, Natural England, come along and they, they rake clear the existing vegetation, they puddle up the mud, and that allows the plant to um, to germinate there. So it's, it's, well, it is a conservation success story. There was uh, an attempt at reintroducing this to a, an adjacent site uh, but again, that that didn't take. The plant wasn't successfully reintroduced. Uh, 
Um, so it's still only in this one, this one site, which is quite vulnerable uh, as it requires this, this regular maintenance to, um, to keep it going. The grasslands themselves are, are very varied. The majority of the grassland, I, I must say, is, is actually very species poor. It's sort of um, MG7 or MG6, sort of lolium perenni grassland um, of, of very little interest uh, to the botanist. More interesting are the, the, the very wet uh, grasslands, such as this um, MG8 meadow here. And this is on the RSPB's West Sedgemoor Reserve. And here, Marsh Marigold Calthoblustris does very well. And this is a very rare community in Britain. But we do seem to have about 30% of the uh, that community in the, in the Somerset wetlands. While we're at West Sedgemoor, uh, I should mention uh, a very attractive, tiny little mud annual again, mouse tail, Myosaurus minimus. This grows on the muddy tracks that cross the moor. Uh, and it's done quite well. We've we've found it in, in a, a few other moors. So it's now been found at King Sedgemoor and it's also at Wetmore and Westmore, I believe. Uh, an early photograph here from the uh, Somerset Rare Plants group. So my joint vice county recorder, Simon Leach. This is his son, Ben, um, who was um, <clears throat> out with us uh, when 1999 and he's... he's his eyes were good at spotting this tiny little plant on the uh, on the West Sedgemoor Reserve there. We do have some uh, rather nice species rich meadows. So here at a place called East and West Waste, we've got a rather nice dry meadow um, full of uh, full of wildflowers, 40 or 40 or more species at least with, with um, some uh, with uh, Southern Marsh Orchid and the like, with Glastonbury Tor in the background there. Unfortunately, as I say, though, that most of the grasslands in the levels now has been slowly lost through time uh, to a, a very species poor, uh, less interesting community. Conservation efforts really focused in from the mid or from the early 1980s on the breeding waders of, of the area, particularly uh, uh, this bird red shank. Uh, there were low numbers, they had declined. The first surveys, I think, were in the mid um, 1970s. And they showed a, a steady decline as the area was drained um, and improved. Red shank, uh, particularly, was one of the, the four that declined quite, quite rapidly. Uh, an environmentally sensitive area um, payment was was launched in Ma in March 1987 to try and uh, partly aimed at breeding waders, but also other aspects of, of the conservation in the area. So red shank and uh, common snipe uh, were targets of that. There was no targeting specifically at the vegetation at, at the rare plants in that sense. In the 19, in 1997, the area was then designated a special protection area and a Ramsar site. Uh, the reason being the large numbers of wintry waterfowl that, that visited the area. At the, uh, pretty close to 100,000 birds actually uh, turned up in the area in the wintertime, as they still do. Uh, and lapwing were one of the, the main features of that, along with other, other duck species. Um, that's been partly successful, but that success mainly comes through the big reserves, particularly the big reserves managed by the RSPB and the Somerset Wildlife Trust. New species have been moving in uh, as well. So here is a great white egret and these moved in and uh, first bred in Britain, actually in the Somerset wetlands um, about 15 years ago. And they are now a very common sight across the area um, as are their close relatives, the cattle egrets. Um, there are hundreds of these now around and you, you see large um, flocks of them in, in the autumn and winter time. Um, 
wet woodland is is a very rare feature. We don't have much woodland at all. Uh, what woodland we do have has some very interesting um, plant communities. So marsh fern is is very common in these uh, these wet woodland and the edges of wet woodland communities. Um, as is the the royal fern, which grows magnificently in in some of the woodlands and some of the fens here as well. A big issue, a very big issue, and probably the biggest issue that there is on the on the Somerset levels, the Somerset wetlands, is the water quality. Here where you can see it's very clearly demonstrated here. We've got runoff from a farm field, sort of arable fields, um, washing into the ditch network here in the in the winter time. This causes a range of problems. And if you look at the um, the level of phosphates here, they they exceed the uh, the set limits quite quite considerably. And as a result of that, a few years ago, Natural England have now moved all of the uh, 12, 15 sites of special scientific interest on the Somerset wetlands into unfavorable declining. Uh, although there's been a lot of work done on on the birds and some plants. It is the water quality that has has driven this um, this decline uh, across the area. Um, that displays itself very clearly in uh, the blanket weed, which can be very excessive, uh, killing off all the the aquatic life under it, completely blocking or covering over the surface of some of the uh, larger and the smaller ditches as well. Some of them. So this is the 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 so-called Sowie River, um, and that's that's blocked by blanket weed. Here on on Moor Lynch, which is another of the SSSIs making up the super national nature reserve, this is the blanket weed that's been pulled out of the ditch, and you can see there's a large amount of that that comes out. Close to the towns and uh, and more built-up areas, there's quite a lot of runoff from the road network bringing in pollutants, of course. Uh, and this uh, area I, I nicknamed the Dead Ditch. It's in the North Somerset Levels of Moors, and you can see this is the outfall. So the, the litter from the town of Nailsey uh, just washes directly into the ditch network there. And this is, in fact, a, a site of special scientific interest. Uh, I know there's a lot of work going on to try and resolve this problem. Uh, but as, as I saw it a few years ago, that there is still still an, a major issue there with with, with water quality, um, and that's that's not going to be an easy easy fix, I'm afraid. A problem that was easier to fix and and probably a conservation success was uh, trying to keep water on the site in the winter time. There was um, there was quite a move to uh, drain the area as dry as possible in the winter time too take the flooding away as soon as possible. And a lot of it was managed by uh, very ancient structures. So here we've got um, uh, a local chap here who's fixing, the, setting the pen, the height of the, the water quality. And you can see here he's actually putting in a boards into this uh, very ancient weir here, uh, a, a stop log structure. One of my jobs, um, was to work with the Environment Agency and the Internal Drainage Board to update all of the structures. And we 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 spent quite a lot of money. I can't remember exactly how much, but it was into the millions, I think, in actually replacing these old structures with with new things like like this uh tilting weir here, uh, which which are much easier to use and they're much better and much easier way to control to control water levels stopping the ditches drying out in uh, in the winter time. So this structure here, uh, as you can see, it's open there so the water can, can just flow out. Uh, and this was replaced by this brand new uh, weir here at um, uh, Grey Lake. And, and this has got massive tilting weirs on it to control the water levels. So that's been a success. Uh, we now have the ability, or, or the, the landowners have the ability now to manage water levels right across the area. Uh, what sort of the problem is now that um, 
flooding is has always been a problem. There's there's records of flooding going way back in 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 history, but in 2013, the winter 2013-14, we had uh, extended and deep flooding right across the area, isolating some of the villages for uh, months on an end, um, stopping people travelling across the area, <clears throat> even stopped the railway line at, at one stage. Uh, and these, this was a major flooding. Uh, there was considerable protests and the call went out for the Environment Agency to dredge the rivers. Uh, and this is Owen Patterson, who was the uh, Secretary of State for the Environment at the time. Um, he, he turned up, uh, there was quite a few angry people there at the time. Um, he forgot his Wellingtons, poor man, so he wasn't particularly uh, liked by the, by the local community, I don't think. And, and uh, nicely captured in private eye there saying, it's all under control. Um, worse than winter flooding is, is summer flooding. And in 2012, so the year before the big winter floods, in the summer, there was a, a very prolonged um, flood that lasted for a, a, a weeks at a time, probably months. The whole area went anoxic. The, um, the water on the floodplains has turned into a black, smelly mess as this sort of this is the water being pumped off of one of the sites. And the result of that um, was this is Currymore, Curry and Haymore's SSSI, part of a special protection area, a Ramsar site. Uh, and that's what it looked like in June, July uh, 2012. So uh, 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 quite a big problem. Uh, the solution to all of this, according to to uh, local people was to dredge the rivers. It's something they felt very strongly about. So the rivers were duly dredged after the winter of uh, in March uh, 2013. Um, and they continue to, to dredge the rivers. Uh, silt is a huge problem, uh, a, a, an issue across the area. And quite frankly, I think that they're, they're fighting a losing battle with some of this. E even this week, we've got extensive flooding again. Other things that made life more interesting was, was uh, the non-native plants that, that turn up. Not too bad, but um, parrot's feather has been known on, on some sites for, for decades now uh, and has, has challenged people to how to control that. Um, this is the River Tone, and here we've got the, the, the wonderful floating pennywort uh, that was first identified in the uh, late 1990s. And it, it can almost completely block the river at times. And the Environment Agency has to come in and spend a lot of money in clearing that out. Uh, water fern, Zola, has been around for, for some time. And that, again, can cause uh, quite a few problems in uh, making the water quality problems even worse in, in some cases. Uh, it does go a really, really nice shade of red in the wintertime though. And there is a weevil, apparently a non-native weevil uh, that can actually uh, reduce it. And that, that seems to be uh, having an effect. Uh, so you get good years with lots of Azola or bad years, I should say. And then good years with, with very little of Azola. So it, it seems to be a bit cyclical. We did, um, and we still have got water primrose, there's La, La Guigia grandiflora here. Uh, it's at one site, although it was at two, but it's at one site. And the poor old landowner uh, has uh, drained all the water out of the ditch and sprayed it, built the ditch up again, and it came back. So he did the same again. Um, he dredged it. Um, and I think last time, my advice when I was still working for Natural England was, I think the easiest thing to do is to fill the ditch in and start again. It, it proved very, very tricky to, to get rid of. Even though it's quite an attractive plant, it, it can be, and it probably is going to be a problem in the future. We had water lettuce turn up, Pistia stratioites. Um, this is actually in the, the, the Taunton to Bridgewater Canal. 
it was cleaned out um, and it doesn't appear to be coming back. It's quite frost. It's intolerant of cold weather. So, so that one at the moment is, is not a is not a major issue. Uh, but again, something to keep an eye on. Um, it's sure to come back again at some time stage. Now, the Somerset wetlands uh, were cut for peat for a long time, probably since the Romans, probably even before the Romans. <clears throat> uh, and there was there was quite an industry in, in what is now called the, the Avalon Marshes or the Brew Valley, cutting peat. Uh, so here we can see sort of um, Edwardian peat cutters stacking up their hand-cut peat um, into these uh, rather attractive sort of structures here to dry the peat out. Things got worse in the 1950s once the diesel pump and the, the mechanical digger were improved and large areas of area were, were actually cut for peat and a lot of peat was, was actually light, lost. Uh, it's still going on to a certain extent, although it has declined somewhat. Uh, the conservation organisations, uh, and here we've got the Somerset Wildlife Trust Great Fen Project, um, took on a lot of these areas that have been cut for peat. So all the peat has gone from, the, most of the peat has gone from this site and it's down to the clay underneath. So the peat Thickness varies from a few metres to about 15 metres in places. But here you can see that the, they've been starting to restore this site. And a few years later, this is what it looks like. So it's open water and reed bed. Uh, and now full of bitterns and other birds of reed bed, bearded reed leaning, etc. So although we've lost a very valuable habitat, uh, something good has come from that in the form of these sort of uh, extensive wetland areas. And, and there we've got um, uh, the vice county recorder there, Helena Crouch, actually surveying one of the lakes that uh, <clears throat> was created by peat cutting and then restored by conservation organisations. This is an ongoing story. There are very few areas left of, of what you might call mire. Um, and all of those mires are now in the hands of conservation organisations from the Somerset Wildlife Trust, uh, Natural England, and a few other smaller organisations as well. And there is a move now to try and do more to restore the, the mire habitats. So this area here known as Ashcott Plot uh, was once completely wooded and over quite a long time, 20 years or so, the woodland has slowly been reduced, uh, water levels have been raised. Um, it's now much more of a mire and in reasonable condition, um, but still needs work doing on it. So there is a, a plant such as the bog pimpernel and, and lesser butterfly orchid are doing well on that site, but there is a plan now to do more and there's two areas that are being worked on at the moment. Uh, these large highland cattle were used uh, as, as, grazing, as grazing animals on the mire. But now the area is now being modified again by uh, a quite a large intervention to try and stop any water running off the sites to, to start the mire or the bog growing again. So this, this one is at, at Shatwick Heath. And this area here is at West Hay Moor. This work is going on more or less as, as we speak now. So local conservation organisations such as uh, the Somerset Rare Plants Group and an organisation known as the Recorders of the Avalon Marshes have been active in uh, collecting data and records on these mire sites. Uh, uh, not a vascular plant, but, but this is a, a little... Uh, Fellows liverwort here called Veilwort, Palavicinia laelii. And the group here that's that's uh, came along and mapped out where this very uncommon plant, little uh, uh, bryophyte was. And that's allowed the conservation organisations to, to take that into account when uh, doing these uh, major interventions on the peatland sites. And people are important. So 
about a hundred thousand people a year visit the the what's now known as the Avalon Marshes. Uh, there's a new centre there, a uh, cafe and gift shop and offices for the conservation organisation and meeting rooms and whatever. Um, and as I say, about 100,000 visitors a year. Uh, some just come for a cup of tea, others walk out and, and look at the bittens and uh, and whatever. But it is, it is becoming very popular uh, in the area. Um, we do have other groups as well. So these are these are the recorders of the Avalon Marshes. They concentrate on the on the less well known groups. So here we're, we're, I think uh, they're looking at dragonfly larvae. <clears throat> uh, dragonflies are, are, are relatively common, as you'd expect in in, in this extremely very wet, varied wetland. And here we've got um, uh, another group from um, some sort of archaeological and natural history society. Uh, coming out on site and, and doing a little recording um, of water beetles, I think, in, in this case. Uh, close to the end now, but I, I, I wanted to finish off by uh, saying that, you know, it's 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 always been a pleasure to work on the levels. You meet some interesting characters. You probably you may not recognise this guy. It's, it's Brett Westwood. He's from BBC Radio 4. Uh, and he was um, recording a radio program um, with a BSBI group. Um, and the pro the program actually still available was called Bitten by the Bug. So it was a uh, BSBI meeting out on South Lake Moor. And that was led by Liz McDonnell, who was uh, Vice County Recorder for VC6 until a few years ago when she she sadly passed away. So. I'll leave it there and ask if you've got any questions. Um, I'm very happy to, to try and answer any of your questions, but but thank you very much for listening. Fantastic, Steve. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. I'll just check if there is uh, a link we can give for Bitten by the Bug. Um, I see we've got a first question in the Q&A, if I can encourage others to pop them in there, but the first one from Joseph Hayward, who asks, are there sphagnum moss species in the Somerset wetlands? There are. Uh, in the areas that are mires, there are a very few, <clears throat> very f small area of mire left, and there are sphagnum mosses. Um, it's not a group I, I know at all, so I couldn't give you any of the, any of the names for the uh, for the mosses. Uh, but there are there are a few, and there have I, I think in the past been attempts to reintroduce them, which which sounds a bit strange. But they brought mosses down from Cumbria at one stage and and planted them out. I understand. Uh, which I think was a complete failure. So, uh, yeah, that's that's probably what's happened there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tim Rich says, great talk. Uh, thanks for that, which is lovely. Thank you, to Tim. Uh, Anna Reza says, do you have any acidic bogs in Somerset as well? No. So in the Brew Valley, it was a lowland raised bog. Um, it's now more fenny habitat. Uh, it was, it's been cut over and drained since as the Roman period, and probably before actually. Uh, and what we've, you know, a very sm small area of bogs, but uh, nothing you would really consider an, uh, um, uh, an acidic bog. But um, little bits of interest. Uh, Nikki Hodges asks, what are your thoughts on beavers returning to the wetlands? Opportunity, threat, and what about the effects of sea level rise? Uh, so, so two very good questions. Beavers, I think, would would will be there one day. I'm pretty sure that there is habitat for them in again this place called the Avalon Marshes. There might be quite a lot of resistance, I would say, from some of the landowners. This is a highly engineered, highly man modified habitat <clears throat> uh, with the Environment Agency, the Internal Drainage Board managing. Uh, the the larger water courses, and I think if the beavers started to make hole in holes in some of these high level carriers, there might be an issue. But there's probably enough habitat, I would say, for for them. So there, they are in Somerset in in various places. So uh, they're on Exmoor and, and doing very well there. And I think they're they're at the top of the river otter as well, um, and probably in other places as well. So. If they're not introduced, they will they will find their own way there pretty soon, I should think. Uh, and I think they have a lovely time. 
and people probably, probably won't even realize they're there for, for a long time. Um, I think the other question was about sea level rise. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so this is a more this is going to be more challenging. If we go back uh, to about six, seven thousand years ago, this area was um, salt marsh. A lot of it was salt marsh, with some archipelago-like islands across that area. Um, and in the not too distant future, hundred to hundred years, I think with coastal sea level rise and the like, then that's likely to go back again so it's it's likely to go back to what it was seven thousand years ago and probably start all through a cycle again um, way beyond our life cycles but yeah the other the other issue uh, about climate change is that um flooding will become more common i think um and flooding in the winter time maybe even the summer time but the other issue is going to be droughts and uh, I, I think that's going to have a, a big impact as well. So, but um, we all know the problems. I think uh, of of climate change, and uh, there don't seem to be too many answers to them at the moment. I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, we've had a question of: Is there a definition of Maya? Is there a definition of Maya? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, there's a number of bird words that can be used to describe a Maya. I think bog. Um, is is the common one that people would use. I think if you look in the NVC, the National Vegetation Classification, we're looking at areas that, are, that, that have sphagnum mosses in them. <clears throat> but effectively, it's it's a marsh, which is another name that, that could be used, or fen. A lot of the uh, a lot of the area is actually um, fen meadow uh, because the 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 water itself is quite eutrophic and is quite rich in calcium. So we do have some fens, not uh, uh, nothing like the extent that they have in, in Norfolk, for example, but we do have small areas of, of fen as well. It's mostly lowland wet grassland or uh, coastal and uh, floodplain grazing marsh. Great, thank you. I've shared the NVC guidance that mentions Myers, so hopefully there's some answers in there as well. Um, Val has asked, can you tell me if there are any carnivorous plant species in the levels and moors? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, we've we've got um, well, the commonest, I suppose, is, is uh, Drosera rotundifolia, uh, which has been known. It's 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 there on on all of the uh, those cutover Mars that I talked about. Um, some clever person um, who we don't know uh, planted some uh, very nice um, trumpet plants, American Saracenas, out on one of the Mars. They probably got a packet of seed and just scattered them across the area, which, which wasn't a very bright thing to do. Uh, when we discovered this, we didn't know really what to do. Um, I talked to the Wildlife Trust and the landowners, and they said, well, it won't do any harm, will it? And then we found evidence, I think it's in Cumbria, that uh, they'd just taken tons of this um, American pitcher plant off of one of their sites. So we we remove them as, as much as we could. But even, I, th I think that was 10 years ago, and they're still popping up now. So it was uh, it was a very successful introduction. Probably shouldn't have been an introduction. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so that's another carnivorous one. And of course, we do have um, one side has got some butterwort on it, right used to. Uh, and we do have bladderwort. Bladderwort is, is a very common plant in a, in a lot of the ditches. Uh, and um, it grows. It, it can form great big long strands in the ditches, and flowers uh, pretty pretty well actually in the summer as well. So yeah, uh, carnivorous carnivorous plants we do have. Great. Are you happy to carry on for a few more minutes, Steve? Is that yep. all right? Yep. We've got more yep. questions. Perfect. Um, Stephen Sylvester has asked, "What is the plant group that needs the most taxonomic research within this area, or do you know of any particular species complexes that urgently need work?" <clears throat> Okay, so we've got two very good groups that do plant recording. One I've already mentioned, which is Somerset Rare Plants Group, formed in uh, 1997, hence the conference that this uh, talk was first given to. Uh, and they record all of, the, all of the plants. So although we call ourselves the Somerset Rare Plants Group, it records all of the groups, all of the plants across 
the whole of Somerset, Wise County 5 and 6. Uh, we've also got um, the Somerset Botany Group, and they are very active, particularly on the levels, particularly on the sites owned by Somerset Wildlife Trust. And they do uh, what you might think of the more boring stuff, as they do quadrating and, and whatever on the on the reserves, um, uh, and the ditch survey and the like sort of thing. So, but we always need, we're always looking for, for more people to to get involved with, with um, plant recording. Yesterday, I think the Somerset Wildlife Trust have published the uh, the, the House of Somerset, um, similar to, to what has been published nationally. And, and one of the things, I've, I've barely read it, but one of the things I noticed in there was that um, Somerset Environmental Records Centre do need, do continue to need more records. So that's that's the state of nature of, for Somerset that was published yesterday. Um, and and it, it picks out a, a lot of the issues that, that I talked about tonight on the Somerset levels, but it, it also does pick out the need for for more volunteer recorders, and and I would always sort of press for that. The more the more botanists we have, the better. Um, and there's there's lots lots of interesting plants that we we need more more research doing on. Fantastic, thank you. I'll try and get that report and say, uh, share the link. Um, uh, an anonymous attendee has said uh, Himalayan balsam is making its way along the Sheppey, Axe, and Parrot. Is it a future threat to the Rhines? Uh, yes, it's quite a lot of it on the um, to River Tone as well. It, it, it's not tolerant to grazing. So where you've got a grazed system, it's it's not a problem. But where you've got ungrazed banks, uh, then it does the, it does dominate. It's not a bigger problem here as it is in, in other places. I know the River Otter, for example, in Devon, uh, the banks are just purple with it in the, in the summertime. But um, as I say, intolerant to grazing, and that seems seems to to keep it under check. Thank you. Um, Mary has asked, "What happened to Currymore after 2012?" After 2012, okay, so it recovered slowly. The a lot of the grassland on Currymore it has been improved, or, or quite a, extensively improved. And those those improved grasslands are not so good at recovering, or not so tolerant of flooding. So the the long longish spring summer flood of twenty twelve killed off a lot of the area, and I think a lot of the grassland had to be re-sown. Um, but for for years afterwards, there was and even today to a certain extent, there's a a, a high burden of um, broadleaf dock. Uh, which which seemed to, to to come in quite quickly after after the flood, but it it had to be effectively um, re-sown re grassland, and I think Defra uh, made special grants available uh, to do that, so it, it returned it back to a to a sort of a, a, a farmed landscape, but but took some time. Lovely, thank you. We've just got four more if we uh, go through these and then we yeah. will uh, call it a night. Uh, Peter McCann has asked, is anyone investigating widespread salt marsh restoration as flood protection, e.g. the Environment Agency or the local wildlife trusts? So just a little bit outside of the, the, the area of this talk is the Sturt Marshes, uh, which is, uh, I think, one of the largest managed realignment, managed retreats in Britain. And this is, it was, the seawalls were realigned by the Environment Agency and the uh, WWT, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, uh, now manage the Sturt Marshes Reserve. Uh, there's a lot of really good science going on there, um, carbon capture uh, and whatever from the, from the development of the salt marsh. So yes, that, that's, that's gone on. There have been other smaller scale realignments uh, along the coast. Um, the big hope to stop the the sea coming into the levels is actually the, the Environment Agency and the Summer Council are building a barrier, like, like a mini Thames barrier, effectively, 
um, and that that's probably going to lead to uh, more salt marsh in, in part of the Severn estuary as well. So, yeah, the, the, there there is that that is going on that has been very successful at, at Sturt marshes. Fantastic. Thank you. When I was growing up on the Somerset levels, I had a fantastic interaction with a farmer once who told me it never started flooding until the Environment Agency turned up, which I thought was a great correlation. Oh, the agency, <laughs> yes. Yeah, they caused it all. Yeah. You will find Bloody them where there is flooding. When, when, the, when the flooding was at its worst, uh, a colleague and I were, were monitoring the extent of flood <clears throat> and a dog walker, we were on this little island and the dog walker he said, it, it's all them bird people. Them bird people did it. So clearly he thought that the flooding was caused by, I assume, the RSPB. And that, that's that's quite a common feeling that the conservation organisations caused the flooding. Um, uh, and I, I still think that there are there are issues today. I know there are still issues today with with, with the perception that that, um, that, that flooding is, is made worse by people wanting to to manage the area for, for wildlife. I think that leads us on. Um, so another anonymous question has said, uh, will the greater winter flooding be good or bad for the local plant communities? I guess that might depend on whether you're a, <laughs> a species that's happy in the water or not. But Yeah, so um, it, it, it's hard to say because a, a lot of the, the truly native areas, that, you know, the, the less modified areas, are very capable of of of, of being in, inundated by by flood water over the winter time. That that's happened for thousands of years. Um, I don't think there's any species that particularly suffer any plant species that suffer from flooding. I, I my guess is that if flooding becomes more frequent, longer, uh, and is intersected with droughts as well. So you get drought, flood, drought, flood, then that, that could start to have impacts on the area. Great, thank you. Um, uh, someone going by the name of moth has asked, uh, have there been any special moth species recorded? <clears throat> well, I'm certainly not a moth expert, but um, the Rome group, the recorders of the Avalon marshes are, are developing new moth traps uh, to monitor uh, sites and that's that's going on now so we, we're we're using led lights i think this is not my area but led lights to to trap moths um uh and that that's going on so but i don't know whether any specialists there's extensive new reed beds that have developed since the end of peat extraction or since areas that they've stopped extracting the peat on and i think they are getting a few reed bed specialists now starting to come into the area but uh i don't really know i can't really answer that in any detail i'm afraid sounds like there's more information out there to be found yeah um great and uh, a final question from uh dominica who was asked um did the dredging help to manage the river pollution and water levels in this area do you dredge regularly since the restoration or was it a one-off event uh no so so they are i believe dredging more regularly now um they've developed so they being the environment agency and the internal drainage boards have developed new ways of, of pressure dredging so that they shoot jets of water under underwater at, at the mud and that re-mobilizes the silt um and they're going to have to do that more and more so uh, there's there's a lot of silt in the system uh and i can't so they either do that forever maybe this new barrier will help um but it but it's always been a problem it's 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 going to be a problem forever sort of thing so uh as i know as i understand it um we're lucky residents in in somerset now pay a little bit more on a, a council charge to uh, an organization known as the somerset rivers authority that was established after the the, the long floods uh and they help fund that uh, problem. Uh, they are funding the dredging um, and, and right across the county. So the, there's equal problems with surface flooding in in the, in the towns as well. So yeah, it's going to go on for a, a long time. Um, 
and I don't know where that if that will ever end 